Great, we'll get started now. So welcome everyone to this webcast on corporate sourcing of renewable energy in India. We um, do want to make sure that we can maximize the floor time for our uh, lineup of speakers today and include enough time for networking at the end too. Um, so I'll try to get past the housekeeping notes fairly quickly. Um, my name is Joyce Lee and I'm the Policy and Operations Director at the Global Wind Energy Council or GWEC, which is an industry association that represents wind power in emerging markets around the world. I'll be your host today, so to speak, and we also have a team online here reachable by chat for any questions or technical issues. Uh, next slide, please. So this webcast on India is just one part of a wider series, which is proudly organized by the Global Wind Energy Council and the RE100, the coalition of companies committing to 100% renewable energy to power their operations. This series is also held in partnership with the international law firm Baker McKenzie, as well as the Global Solar Council representing solar power around the world. As you can see here, our next editions will focus on Taiwan, Japan, and markets across Southeast Asia and Australia. And that's really to highlight these emerging markets for renewable energy where corporate demand could become a significant driver of growth. Uh, next slide. Just a quick note on navigating this platform. Um, you've made it past registration and found your way into session, so you're already in the right place. Um, here in sessions, we'll be running the webcast, and afterwards, we'll be running the small group networking rooms, which are open to RE100 members, GWEC members, and Global Solar Council members. But that said, anyone in the audience is free to try out the networking function just below sessions on the left, where you'll be paired for a randomized one-on-one -on -one match for a five-minute conversation. While you're here, I encourage you to double click on the slide screen now to maximize it for your own ease of viewing. And at any time during presentations, you can send through a question into the session's chat and our moderator will be monitoring this uh, to pull in questions for the roundtable later. You can also click on the people tab on the top right here to check out who else is attending and you can view their profiles, live links to their social media profiles and websites and also invite someone to a video call. Finally, for those who are engaging in small group networking after the webcast, you can request to share audio and video by clicking on the blue button at the very top here. So today we're very privileged to be joined by a roster of experts on corporate sourcing of renewable energy in India. We have Executive Director of the Climate Group India, Divya Sharma, who will begin with opening remarks, and then we'll have back-to-back -back presentations from Paul Kerno and Andrew Zaw of Baker McKenzie, speaking about the legal and regulatory framework for corporate PPAs in India. This will be followed by Mayank Bansal, who's, the, who's from Renew Power, and will be speaking about the sell side experience and challenges in this market. These experts are going to be joined by Bhavna Kassad of WWF India and Shailesh Talang of CDP India for a roundtable discussion at the very end, so make sure you stick around. And this discussion will be moderated by Atul Mudalyar of the Climate Group India. So with that, I'm going to kick things off by handing it to Divya Sharma for brief opening remarks. Thanks, Joyce. I, I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, you are. We can hear you just fine. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and greetings of Climate Group. I'm very happy to be representing RE100, an initiative led by Climate Group in partnership with CDP. Um, the RE100 initiative led by Climate a group brings together world's leading companies committed to sourcing 100% electricity from renewable sources. Um, it is a voluntary and global pledge requiring all company operations to move to RE across all geographies. Um, climate change impacts are increasingly being felt and will be devastating for health and economy. Cyclone Afan in India, locust swarms and extreme heat events in India are reminders of the crisis we are already in. Um, latest signs about the impacts of climate change in India um, supports that the climate crisis, if left unchecked, will be devastating for public and environmental health and also economic growth. It also tells us that if we take bold action now and set the economy on a pathway to a zero carbon recovery, we can still prevent the crisis. Investing in a clean energy future, therefore, is the only way to ensure sustained growth, job creation, and a resilient long-term economic recovery. Needless to say, this has a potential to reduce India's reliance on energy imports, leading to energy independence and security. Renewables delivered more than two-thirds of India's new generation capacity additions in the last fiscal year. 
um, as per the latest analysis of the International Ed Energy Agency, energy efficiency and renewable energy investments are the best recovery tools and shows it is possible to save and create millions of jobs while putting emissions into structural decline. Um, India's energy mix is already shifting towards renewables, yet there is a need to spur up clean energy transition in India. At Climate Group, uh, through our campaigns like RE100, our mission is to be instrumental in supporting faster climate action. And we engage with actors that are key in bringing this shift and have potential to make a um, long-term shift in the market. Two-thirds of the world's electricity demand is from businesses. And therefore, there is huge scope and opportunity at this end of the spectrum to bolster commitment to clean energy transition across the board. Businesses in India and around the world, including the heavy industry, are showing a net zero future is possible, necessary and urgent, including over 40 companies in India committing to reduce emissions in line with the science. Businesses are our major market force in, in driving the decarbonization of the power sector with corporate electricity demand accounting for about 50% of total electric consumption in India and globally. Infosys, Dalmia Cement, Mahindra Holidays and Resorts and Tata Motors are Indian headquartered companies that have voluntarily adopted 100% renewable energy electricity targets by joining the Climate Group and CDP's RE100 initiative. They are among the 40 plus RE100 global companies having operations in India. Higher adoption of renewable energy by corporates is rapidly shifting global energy markets to an increasingly decarbonized energy system. Even in difficult economic times, businesses are stepping ahead on climate. Recent announcement from, from Reliance, Renew Power, and the Tata's are evidence of this change. We have a very distinguished panel today who will inform us how more and more business can become part of the clean energy transition, talking us through the market readiness and regulatory environment, as well as the challenges and opportunities around deploying RE in their operations. I welcome them again. I will now hand over to Joyce to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much, Divya, um, for those important opening remarks. Um, so we're going to kick off our presentations first with a presentation from Paul Kerno, a partner in Baker McKenzie's Sydney office, um, as well as Andrew Zaw, a local principal in Baker McKenzie's Singapore office, on the market readiness and legal and regulatory framework of corporate PPAs in India. Uh, so we'll begin that presentation now. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Kerner. I'm a partner with Baker McKenzie in Sydney and also global co-head of our renewable energy practice for Baker McKenzie. And it's my pleasure to be joining you this afternoon to talk about corporate PPAs in India as part of the ARIA 100 webinar on corporate PPAs. So today I'm going to touch on the current regulatory framework and look at some of the challenges with the existing framework. Then we'll look briefly at some of the proposed regulatory reforms. And finally, touch on the emergent energy trading that's starting to occur in India and what that means for the development of financial PPAs uh, and what that can mean for the corporate PPA market. So let's have a look at the current regulatory framework. So what is the market like at the moment? Obviously, India has been a significant driver of corporate PPAs globally, and we saw PPAs flourish through 2017, 2018, largely driven by the waivers on the open access charges that were offered by key states. ended and so while we saw in the first half of last 
year that India continued to be the second largest market for corporate PPAs, with a global share of just under 8%. The annual corporate PPA addition in India has declined probably by about 30 to 35 percent around uh, compared to those numbers from 2018. And I think this is in, in part due to obviously the reintroduction of those open access charges uh, and some of the constraints around the physical market that underpins corporate PPAs. So let's then turn to the regulatory framework that currently exists. Obviously, the key driver for renewables to date has been the open access regime, which allows large customers to contract directly with generators to buy their electricity. That can be from any source, of course, but for those looking to buy from renewables, which of course competes in terms of its wholesale price, that's been an attractive way of doing so. Now, given the physical market nature of the open access regime, there are a number of access charges that are regulated by each state individually by the DISCOMs, which cover the use of the public grid to get electricity from the generator to a buyer. So these are charges such as transmission, wheeling and other cross-subsidy charges. So these have been considerable in the past and when they were waived, of course, they made buying um, under direct PPAs between corporate customers and generators very attractive. But now that they apply again in most states, that has put a dampener on the growth in corporate PPAs. And we've generally seen total charges being between three and six US cents per kilowatt hour. You also need approval for open access from dis discoms, which can be hard in some states, particularly uh, given the financial pressure that can then uh, be placed on discoms where they're signing up PPAs under tariffs with uh, uh, renewable energy generators, but with reduced customer demand, perhaps not covering the full cost of those PPAs. And so we have seen some criticism of DISCOMs that are looking to cancel or renegotiate signed PPAs, which has introduced some uncertainty in the market. And of course, from a project financing point of view, as my partner Andrew Zor from Singapore will talk about later in the Q&A, this can be um, particularly problematic. The other policy framework are captive projects. So captive project refers to where a corporate buyer makes an equity investment, which has to be at least 26% in the generation asset, and they must procure over 51% of gen energy from that asset. These can be done with a single buyer or they can be done in a group. So you have captive projects or group captive projects. Captive projects may still be subject to open access charges. However, they're generally less than when it's not a captive project. Uh, and so you don't have, you have some of those cross subsidy other surcharges waived. So we've certainly seen captive projects become more popular as a result of the lower access charges. But of course, there's a downside to that for corporates because it does mean that you have to take in these generation projects which means you have to make a much greater investment decision rather than just buying power under a long-term PPA, you actually have to take an equity position and be involved in the ownership and risks that come with owning that project. The other area of policy uh, is around behind the meter projects and net metering. So behind the meter projects, like many countries around the world are possible. And in fact, in India, we've seen a significant growth in the rooftop market, which has driven um, a lot of the corporate PPAs for smaller size projects. So I think at the moment, the cumulative installed rooftop solar capacity in India has reached about 5.4 gigawatts, about 3.96 of that is commercial industrial. Now, uh, customers with behind the meter generators can be charged the net amount of electricity, electricity that they use over a period of time. There have been some changes to this. One of those is decreasing the net, net metering calculation period from one year to one month. And so this change from annual to monthly net metering reduces the customer's ability to account for seasonal variation generation. So 
it's making the overall economic benefit through net metering slightly less attractive. And of course, the other challenge with behind the meter projects is they are relatively small. They can only be used for generators under one megawatt, and it's of course limited to a percentage of the fire's load. So you tend to see some constraint on the on the overall ability of behind the meter PPAs to service the appetite for corporates wanting to procure up to 100% of their load uh, because of those geographical limitations it needs to be co-located with the buyers and that restricts economy of scale. So turning then to renewable energy certificates, which is another policy framework that also contributes to the corporate PPA market. So RECs are obviously closely linked to the renewable purchase obligation scheme that exists at the moment, whereby relevant entities are obliged to purchase certain quantities of renewable energy. And the REC therefore represents the green attribute of the electricity that is generated from these renewable energy sources. And of course, the benefit of REC markets around the world, as in India, is that you can unbundle that green attribute from the physical electricity and the two products can then be sold and traded separately. Now, the challenge with this is that renewable, generate, renewable energy generators who have entered into long-term PPAs with DISCOMs for the sale of electricity at preferential tariff rates are not eligible to participate in the REC scheme. That would be double dipping. Um, but the additional cost of renewable energy certificates does add to the existing power costs. So if you are a corporate buying your power from DISCOM, you don't have a direct PPA with a renewable energy project, and you want to use RECs as a way of meeting your renewable energy target, it's possible, but it does become more costly because on top of that physical price that you're paying the DISCOM, you have to pay the REC price. Uh, and so, yes, it's a way of meeting renewable energy targets, but it's not necessarily the most cost-effective way of doing so. So let's now turn to some of the proposed regulatory reforms to see what they look like. So the federal government has released the draft electricity amendment bill 2020, which was released a couple of months ago in April. And that covers a few specific areas of reform, some of which could go to helping to continue to support the growth in the corporate PPA market. One of those is the National Renewable Energy Policy that drives the RPO scheme. And this would this change would see the federal government prescribing minimum renewable purchasing percentages to be set by state commissions. At the moment, the RPOs are set by the states, but this policy could allow for national consistency. And of course, the higher the RPO, then of course, more demand for uh, renewable purchasing, uh, which would obviously support the market. The other key area would be to address the cross subsidy and how this can be better passed to consumers and help speed up tariff adoption by discounts. This policy is expected to progressively reduce cross-subsidy charges, which of course would be good news for corporates looking to do direct PPAs. Uh, at the moment, tariffs for new PPAs between discounts and generators are commonly set through a reverse auction process, process, although there have been some issues with the adoption of those tariffs by discounts, hence the attractiveness of generators looking to contract directly with corporates. And so this national tariff policy reform would be uh, helpful in that respect. And then there's some other related measures around stricter enforcement of RPOs and also stricter enforcement of PPAs. Again, this goes to you know, the bankability issue of PPAs or debt financing in the market. So let's have a look now at energy trading in India and what might that mean looking forward in terms of really opening up the corporate PPA market. So I think the question here is, will we, how quickly will we see the growth of a true wholesale pool market for electricity? Now, until June 2020, energy was traded on day ahead markets, but generally speaking, DISCOM's power procurement was dominated by long-term contracts, which is why we've seen some pressure on DISCOMs because they've entered into PPAs which are perhaps no longer in the money. And so only about 10% of electricity is that was procured by the short-term market. The CERC 
introduced uh, or recommended the introduction of a real-time market, which would be an intraday market, and that uh, started in June 2020. Now, that is similar to other integrated trading platforms around the world and incorporates some exchange trading elements, um, for example, out of Europe and experiences there. And basically, it allows the buying and selling of wholesale electricity from anywhere in India within states and between states. And so the participants in this real-time market will, of course, be discons and generators, and it can actually be those with existing long-term PPAs or those without. Now, what are the benefits of this, and what does that really mean for the corporate PPA market? So the RTM is expected to benefit discons in a number of key ways. First of all, there will be access to a larger pool of generation resources to meet their contingent requirement in real time as against their existing bilateral resources. Now, it's fair to say that a lot of the generation that would be uh, attractive to discounts in a real-time market won't necessarily be renewables, but more baseload power, particularly given the variability of renewables and perhaps the, uh, the over-contracting of discounts at the moment. But over time, having a larger pool of generation resources and being able to buy that in real time on an hourly basis and match that better against actual customer loads will mean that uh, we will see discounts move away from long-term PPA contracting uh, to buy more through these uh, real-time markets, this, large, this, this tool market. And that will be beneficial, as I'll talk about in a minute, for corporate PPA. The other benefit is that prices discovered in our real-time markets are likely to be more efficient than the cost of procurement power from the bilateral arrangements. And in the event that generators with PPAs are selling unrequisitioned surplus power into the real-time market, these net gains can actually be shared with discoms on a 50-50 basis. Alternatively, discoms themselves can sell surplus power from their contracted generation sources in real-time markets and earn the revenue in full. And this would really address one of the issues at the moment uh, where you've got excess power being bought by discoms on the long-term PPAs but not being able to sell that power into other markets. So pool markets, like a real-time market that's been recently introduced, ultimately allow for more options to structure corporate PPAs and the way that this, that this can happen is through what we call virtual PPAs, which are in fact financial hedges. So this is really starting to think about corporate PPAs being a financial arrangement between a generator and a corporate and a discom that sits over above the physical market. And this is what we see in, in many markets around the world when we think about corporate PPAs. It's what happens in Europe, it happens in some of the US markets, particularly Texas. It happens in Australia um, and, and others where there's a pool market. So what could this look like in the future in India? So you have a, a solar project, for example, that would be selling into the physical market, the, the real-time market. The DISCOM buying power from that project in real time. So there's a spot price that's emerging. On top of this, you have a financial market whereby the corporate can contract with the solar project under a PPA and it pays a fixed price to that solar project and in return receives the spot price that that solar project is receiving from the pool. It then, and that's what we call a swap or a contract for difference where you have a, a difference paid between the fixed and floating price. On the other side of the equation, you then have the, the agreement between the corporate and the utility for the physical supply of power, which would incorporate uh, the financial arrangement. Uh, and so this would be a way for corporates to manage their overall cost of power by being able to contract directly with cheaper sources. Um, and it wouldn't, wouldn't detract from the opportunity for discoms or the ability of discoms to still be uh, dispatching buying power into the real-time market. And this is how, as I said, how we see a lot of markets have developed around the world. Of course, this is, I mentioned this because I think it's a really interesting way that the Indian market could develop 
now that real-time markets have been introduced. But of course, this all relies on liquidity. At the moment, there's insufficient liquidity for these structures to really be put in place in any meaningful way. But I do think that's a, a, a great opportunity for India to develop this market further. So I'll finish up there uh, and we will now hand over to the next presenter. And I look forward to answering questions with you in the panel session coming up later on. Thank you. Great, thank you very much um, for a very substantive presentation from uh, our experts at Baker McKenzie. Uh, I'd now like to, um, the next presentation, we have uh, Mayank Bansal, who's the President of Strategy and Operations at Renew Power in India, and he'll be speaking about the sell side perspective of the corporate market. So I'll hand it to him now. So today, uh, you know, we'll just like to talk a little bit more about uh, our experience in the corporate uh, sector renewable uh, renewable buying. Uh, as you know, Renew Renew Power is one of the largest renewable players in India, and we do have a very strong portfolio in what we call our B two B sales as well. Corporate sales for renewable is actually a very big opportunity. This this slide just captures where we see in terms of the total quantum of uh, energy that can be sold. So as you you know, some of you might be aware, fifty percent of energy in India is already consumed by the corporate sector. Uh, that accounts to almost twenty five gigawatt opportunity by twenty twenty three. And what we've started seeing is uh, you know there are two trends that are really behind uh, this opportunity. One is obviously the the whole corporate sustainability and impact that it has on uh, environment and health and all the factors around being a good corporate citizen. But I think the other aspect that's really shaping up uh, very well for renewables is actually the cost mandate. Renewables today is one of the most competitive form of new new energy addition and uh, becomes the cheapest electricity option for a lot of corporates. Now, that is something that really is likely to drive uh, the corporate market. Uh, so if you look at, you know, the, the below graph just talks about electricity consumption in India. So we have around 1,200, 1,300 billion units being consumed in India, out of which you know, 600 plus is actually in corporates. 20% of that almost is captive power. And so these are very presumably old captive power plants that, uh, that actually could be shifted into much competitive uh, renewable energy form uh, as early as, uh, you know, within this year or next year. And then the remaining is obviously market purchases, which comprise both of the long-term bilateral purchase, which will be hard to displace. But then there is a significant proportion of short-term and bilateral uh, purchases as well as uh, discount purchases. I would just like you to take away that, you know, one, uh, cost mandate is, is improving for renewables to beyond, and that's beyond the environmental challenges and the environmental benefits actually that renewables presents. And uh, the second is just the fact that it is around 25 gigawatt opportunity for renewables. Looking a little deeper into uh, renewable solutions and you know what kind of benefits do they really offer in terms of cost advantage. So typical tariffs, if you'll see for discoms will be in the range of seven to eight rupees. And you know with renewables, when you look at uh, delivered tariffs, they can be anywhere in the range of four and a half to five and a half rupees. So that's almost a 30-35% advantage that you can try and see. This is just on the discount tariffs, but you know this, we have also seen this on some of the captive coal plants, and we believe that RE tariffs are also going to be very competitive in, in, against those as well. In terms of regulatory environment, we clearly believe that the regulatory environment has already been set up. Most of this is possible even in today's environment. And one of the things that's really changing is actually moving renewables from the intermittent source that it was, or it was always considered, and a highly variable source into a much more firm power source. So if you look at solutions that are emerging, you know, you look at hybrids, you look at you know, gas blended with hybrid, you look, look at storage having become cheaper. You could, you can really get into solutions which can give you supply for, you know, 70 to 80% or give you availability in that range for the future. That's really the landscape in some ways. But if you really see what is happening today, we really see only 3% of energy uh, that is actually supplied by RE through for corporates. And so there is clearly a dichotomy here in terms of one, one side, we look at all these opportunities, we look at the business case for uh, renewables. And, but at the, at the, on the other end, we see that the penetration is really low. There are some things that need to change for corporates to really go after and capture this opportunity. I would like to look at just uh, actually three buckets of challenges as I would want to call them, but really these are imperatives and what people need to do. You know, as a developer, it is very easy to get uh, blaming on the regulatory authorities and that's, that's the easiest place to start. 
usually is saying that you know it's, it's all in the regulation but as i said you know broadly i think the regulations are in in place the regulatory framework does exist in india while there are some improvements that can be done and we know about those some of those and you know we i'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion on that but actually i would like to focus more on really what it requires for developers and the customers or the consumers to do right so from a developer standpoint one of the big things that was happening in the past as i said was you know there were really no solutions in the re space that could offer you know significantly higher availability it was all in the 20 to 30% uh, kind of uh, clf cufs and plfs earlier but you know now you have products which are almost 80% plus kind of cufs and we have seen what kind of competitive tariffs they can lead to as well with rtc uh, which was recently done the rtc tender by seki which yielded a a levelized tariff of almost 3.3 rupees or 3.4 rupees and a first year tariff of almost 2.9 rupees right it was it was much better than any other thermal bid that has happened recently the other thing was really you know that these were all solar and wind solutions which now by the way all has changed so this is a one this is one big shift that developers will need to make that you know instead of pushing standard solutions onto customers they'll need to come up and think about you know what are the what are the solutions that can really make sense for my customers and uh, we have seen for example hybrid we've seen uh, you know rtc kind of power we've seen blending as i said with storage blending with gas so there are different options that developers need to offer to our to our customers right and that's that's one of the biggest things that developers need to do the second is on on the customer side one shift that does need to happen is that this is a reasonably complex solution space and it is not easy for a customer to really get used to all the open access solutions the virtual power virtual ppa solutions you know hybrid solution and it's, it's a relatively difficult space to find your way around and that's an important switch because you know you, customers are more or less used to uh, you know very simplistic style of buying where they go to the discount and then you know just try and figure out uh, what the what the cost of electricity is and then they pay up that and then that's it right but i think uh, in the new space uh, re re would be a lot more complex and especially if you're looking at large so large sourcing solutions and so that's one important shift in mind and shift in in from a change management perspective that people or, or corporates will need to tackle and you know, we have seen some uptake in small rooftop projects but we haven't really seen the large uptake that is possible on uh, open access and on you know uh, hybrid and rtc kind of products the second part of uh, you know the customers is really around there is a need for a, a little bit of uh, capital uh, requirement right up front because of minimizing the uh, the css and the adds in the in various states and uh, just from a regulatory standpoint if that can be addressed from a regulatory standpoint it can get away with it but let's assume that that is there then even that there is a there, there's some capex requirement and uh, so the customers have to start feeling okay about that investment and that can be a little tricky in this today's environment for sure but you know the fact is that this this investment would would have very short payback period within you know 2 to 3 years and uh, we actually anticipate that this should be a big focus given the growth agenda or growth capex for a lot of customers might be at a hold i think this should be seen as a cost saving agenda which anyway should get priority then on the regulatory authorities i think we'll have i'm sure we'll have we'll talk a lot more about this going forward but i think there is as i said there is genuine intent for the government to move towards offering alternate solutions for customers and i think this this should be largely taken care of so uh, at the end i would say you know the corporates will really need to think about uh, implementing suitable solutions in three different buckets right so there is pure play vanilla wind and solar which uh, is is really suitable for some industrial customers you know which have a very limited time of day or peaking requirement but might not be best suited for all you know and it will only suit uh, customers who are looking to to uh, to get re up to maybe 20 to 30% of their total uh, total requirement right the second is uh, really hybrid and rtc kind of solutions and those are solutions that really require you know almost 80% plus energy supply and you know they can be the real uh, firm solution for industrial customers that need round the clock uh, power and uh, these will be offsite solutions uh, you know so those those are likely to be complex as i said but can be very interesting and a third would be you know where you don't have a very high uh, requirement in one site but your your requirement is more or less distributed across the country and a very fragmented a load and there we 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 would say that you know virtual ppas are something that we should you know customers should definitely look at so uh, just to summarize uh, you know what what i'm trying to what i've tried to cover in this uh, presentation very briefly is really that 
uh, as we see it from renew power you know over the next 3 to 5 uh, 3 to 5 years it's a very large scale opportunity almost 25 gigawatt plus of uh, corporate energy procurement uh it is it is becoming very competitive in terms of cost and besides has the added advantage of uh, environmental health benefits however it's very nascent in its current stage and we don't see the uptake right now yet but even despite the cost competitiveness and despite all these advantages and the regulatory framework being there there are things that need to be done across the board you know developers need to think of it differently the customer needs to think of it differently and the regulator regulatory push would be important as well but new solutions so uh, you know like rtc kind of solutions which make uh, re you know not only cheap but actually reliable will be the way forward uh, economy and you know for that really a very close collaboration is required across the three stakeholders that need to come together to uh, to get this done that that's about it that i wanted to share thanks thank you very much and i think that lays a really good foundation for our um move into that that stage now um that's a uh, presentation of challenges versus opportunities and potential resolutions to those challenges i think will um lay a really good foundation for a discussion now just a quick reminder before i hand it to our moderator atul mudalir uh you can at any point uh share a question in the session chat if if you're in the event chat feel free to share a question there we'll make sure that it goes to the right person um, we already have the chat going back and forth in the chat, so do feel free to join in. And and with that, I'll hand it to Atul. Great, thank you, Joycey. Thanks for the uh, introduction. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be partnering with the Global Wind Energy Council today. And uh, once again, a very warm welcome to all the speakers and participants. Uh, one uh, one job done easy is because of uh, the outstanding presentations from Paul and Maya. Um, I think they have really very clearly laid the operating context for corporate sourcing in India, including explaining the policy, legal and regulatory frameworks. Uh, of course, they've also highlighted the existing set of barriers and the opportunity that it offers for business. Um, so thank you for that, Paul and Mayank. Um, also would want to take a moment to welcome the other participants uh, and speakers on the panel today for the discussion. Uh, Bhavna Prasad, who is the director at WWF India and leading the work on sustainable business and is also responsible and person in charge for leading the READY program in India, which is the Renewable Energy Demand Enhancement Program. Welcome, Bhavna. Uh, I'll also welcome Shailesh Telang, uh, who's the person in charge and technical manager for uh, renewable energy work in CDP India and is also the lead point of contact for uh, all technical queries on RE100. Uh, with that, um, and without any further delay, I'll move to an interesting part of the conversation and start with Bhavna Prasad. Uh, Bhavna to you, uh, and uh, we would certainly want to hear a bit more about WWS effort in India, specifically around the Ready program, given that you already have, you're just almost a year old and you've already got 16 companies which have committed to this platform. Pretty similar to the way we engage on RE100 at the Climate Group. Uh, you've also done an ex exhaustive study and a comprehensive study uh, in the recent past, which has looked at the global RE market and examined possible instruments for corporate RE sourcing. and uh, has uh, and have also assessed its practicality in the Indian context. Uh, with that context, uh, we would love to hear from you what is Ready's outlook on uh, corporate procurement in India in terms of what instruments uh, have the highest uptake in India so far? And in your view, what are the alternate instruments that see the highest potential in India and why? So with that, I'll pass it on to you for now. Um, thank you, Atul, and thank you very much, and a good afternoon uh, for inviting WWF to be part of this forum. Very interesting and uh, very positive to hear about some of the previous uh, conversations that have already been had. Um, I, I think a lot of them have already been covered. I'm really glad it makes my um, life easier because a lot of the conversations, specifically about the specific uh, flexible, flex, uh, flexible mechanisms, has already been covered. 
Um, I'll just touch upon some of the aspects about uh, the READY program um, as it is, exists um, and how it sort of dovetails into some of the work that uh, RE100 does, which is uh, primarily to lead towards um, achievement of higher targets uh, towards renewables. And um, our program was primarily developed um, as a result of some of the conversations that we had. Uh, see, my consumers, uh, who Mayank mentioned, are constituted about 50% of the RE consumption in the country. Um, so as part of that, we felt that it was important to really understand what are the kind of issues that uh, companies are facing in increasing uptake of renewables in the country. And um, one of the things that was very evident and very strong um, in terms of the feedback that we got was that almost 50%, I would say even more than that, were actually uh, stymied primarily because of policy and regulatory barriers that were restricting RE uptake in the country. And that kind of kick-started the program uh, which we're currently running, which is READY, Renewable Energy Demand Enhancement, um, uh, primarily because of barriers such as uh, policy barriers, such as inconsistency in policy and regulation across states, because a lot of companies aren't necessarily in one location. They are across different states, um, changing policies, regulations, drastically impacting project viability. Um, cross-subsidy surcharges, additional surcharges, transmission and wheeling charges, um, the inconsistency, especially across these um, in different states. So some of these aspects came across very strongly in terms of uh, what are the challenges that they were facing. Um, they also were facing things like grid access, um, uh, not enough uh, uh, TND infrastructure in the country or uh, not enough flexible mechanisms available. So a lot of these overall barriers, including infrastructure and technical barriers, financial barriers, uh, renegotiation of PPAs, and, and all of those kind of uh, sort of emerged, but policy and regulatory being the biggest challenge, and that's um, one of the reasons why we felt it was important to bring this. Um, and, and this resonated with a lot of the companies that we were talking to. Um, and so we felt that it is important to bring that up at the MNRE level and MNRE has been very receptive, has initiated discussions on that with the CNI consumers and, and, uh, and, and, and they recognize that in order for the companies to achieve RE100 targets, uh, which is what um, we are very supportive of, we feel that a lot of these um, challenges need to be addressed in order to achieve that. Um, and we also decided to explore some of the alternative mechanisms that were um, available. And I think um, Paul from Baker has already um, primarily touched upon some of the uh, global mechanisms that are already in place, whether it's um, uh, corporate PPAs or VPPAs, um, um, some of the um, IREX, uh, dedicated renewable power exchanges, P2P trading. So a lot of these mechanisms were mechanisms that we reviewed as part of our next uh, research that we had done and exploring them in context to explore whether these were relevant from an India perspective and how they would work. And based on that, we felt that some of the mechanisms such as green tariff models, uh, VPPAs, uh, dedicated renewable power exchanges, and looking at P2P trading would be interesting mechanisms to explore. Um, and, and we felt that, um, for example, for where um, um, uh, off-site um, social or solar power projects couldn't be set up because of accessibility or um, other issues, um, there could be other um, sort of models, whether it's uh, buying power from the exchanges or specifically dedicated renewable energy exchanges, for example or buying directly from the DISCOM, but you could buy renewable energy directly from the DISCOM, and that could be called as part of the green tariff model. This needs to be worked out. There seems to be a fair amount of interest um, on both the CNI consumer side and also with the DISCOMs, and that's something that we're exploring with various um, agencies, um, and, and, and that's, that's what's sort of emerging as, as an interesting model to consider. Um, dedicated power exchange is also another mechanism. So even if companies are able to say achieve 70% of renewables through of uh, open access uh, mechanisms, these other alternative mechanisms could be used in um, achieving 100%. And, and that's what we're exploring as part of uh, some of the research and analysis and also piloting some of these um, in India. Um, so Atul, um, that, that, that's... Uh, about it from my side. Thank you, Bhavna. Thank you so much. I think uh, one thing that's come out 
pretty much clear, uh, Bhavna, from what you've said is uh, the market is generally ready. Um, uh, the question is, is uh, the regulator ready to kind of open up some of the options that are available? We've, we've seen the VPPA, we've seen the green tariff model. Uh, there is a conversation of a real-time market that's happening in India and how that's going to stimulate and accelerate a few other options into India as well. Uh, but the question is, is the regulatory mechanism ready for us to kind of absorb some of those options? With that, I'll move to the next part of it, um, which is oh, there's one stakeholder which is really ready, and I think that's clearly coming out from the traction we have received so far uh, with the RE100 campaign, wherein we've got globally around 240 companies committing to that ambition. We've got around 40 plus companies in India which have that ambition and are moving towards the target. Um, one of the questions that come to us, and I'll take this question to Paul, Andrew, and Mayank, maybe in that sequence. Uh, with this ambition, with this readiness of moving toward this target, where should a company actually begin from? And I'm asking this question from a few perspectives. One is, what are the real practical options available for uh, companies today in India to kind of achieve that 100% target? What, what is the starting point for them? Um, We've heard about you know companies hitting a ceiling, which is uh, you know say a forty percent ceiling, a fifty percent ceiling, and that ceiling of course you know changes from companies to companies and the kind of industry that they are working in. But these ceilings are really created by you know the technological options that are available and the policy and regulatory impediments. So if companies with that kind of ambition want to move beyond that ceiling, one, what are the practical options that are available? And uh, and if, if that needs to happen, how one the second piece to it is how soon can that happen? Given that there's also a new conversation on um, having unlimited supply, 24 by supply, round the clock supply, with those mechanisms coming into picture. So I take this question to Andrew, Paul, and Mayank, and with that, I'll also kind of. Uh, my apologies, Andrew, I, I couldn't introduce you at the beginning, but I also welcome you to the panel. Uh, maybe I can pose this question to you and then take it to Paul and Mike. Well, I, I'm, happy to, sure. I'm happy to kick off and, 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 um, and uh, yeah, we'll, Andrew will add to it as well. But I think um, maybe just the first observation, um, you know, I think India's got all the, all of the, everything that I've mentioned um, yeah, you've, you've pretty much got all the different elements of how to do corporate PPAs. There's a patchwork, lots of different options. You know, it's not an efficient market at the moment um, because I guess, you know, the ways that you have to piece together all those different options to get over, up to 100%, I don't think it delivers you the best cost outcome. And that's not unique to India. Every, every market has the same challenge, whether it's Australia, Europe, um, Southeast Asia, Latin America. What we've found with a lot of our clients um, who signed up to IO100 or the others who have commitments, not necessarily part of IO100, it's a patchwork, not just around the world, but even within countries. And so, um, yeah, India is not alone in, in the challenge of how to do this. And I think it's, it's fantastic that you've got all the ingredients there and you've got the appetite uh, from, from corporates, which is obviously really important. So I think the the... I guess the first thing to really point out is that, you know, I think there's been a fundamental shift in renewables purchasing over the last, even only over the last three or four years, um, in that, you know, corporates, let's not be shy about the fact that corporates want to do this because it's also cheaper and it should be cheaper. We should be really excited and supporting the whole idea that you sign up to these targets and you commit to renewables because actually it's a cheaper option in many markets. Um, and so I think what we find is that the challenge of getting to 100%, you know, you, you're not going to do that at every cost. You're not going to go to 100% at all costs. You need to make sure that there's an efficient way of meeting that 100% target. Um, and so I think, you know, I think it is going to take some time for, for corporates in India to get to 100%, as you say, the 50% ceiling is hard due to those regulatory barriers and the fact that at the moment, you know, your corporate PPA market is largely a physical market. The corporate PPA buying market at the moment in India is largely tied 
to the underlying physical market. And, as, and so long as it is, is tied to the underlying physical market, you'll have that constraint of really being able to get to 100%. But, you know, those elements are there. I think all those things that WWF have mentioned, what I talked about, um, yeah, I think that those opportunities will come. Um, so I think, you know, I think the first thing is you have to map out, of course, um, understanding what the cost of your existing uh, power procurement is and work out over a certain time frame how you can transition to 100% with the different options that makes that both cost effective and obviously achieves your committed targets. So I think um, obviously going beyond 50%, and I think um, Mayank mentioned that, of course, the virtual market, um, particularly where you're not a large user and you've got a fragmented load or you have a fragmented um, load across India, um, being able to buy through those virtual mechanisms is going to be really important to deliver 100% or get to 100% targets. Um, so there are a couple of thoughts from me, but I'll just see if Andrew wants to add to that and then we can pass on to that. Yeah, um, thanks, Paul. I, I will pick up um, on that. I think one of the, the interesting things to think about in, in terms of the goal of getting to 100 really is, is that actually, you know, as, as Paul mentioned, given the cost considerations, especially for um, high power consuming companies um, in particular industries, you know, is it really realistic that we're aiming for 100? And, and I think the only way you can do that with the sort of, uh, with the constraints currently on, on in, in the physical um, power market is or power PPAs is if there are um, either the virtual um, uh, cost-effective means of purchasing power on a virtual basis, or if the the real-time market can develop sufficient liquidity such that some of those other solutions uh, that uh, have been taken up in other jurisdictions uh, can be implemented. So I, I think you know, if um, the financial hedges for um, or financial swaps for um, uh, power and PPAs can be done, then that's one way that you can take that and break that ceiling from 50 to 100. But um, especially for high energy consuming um, companies. I think it, it is a real challenge whilst um, we're limited by um, physical PPAs. I just, sorry, can I just add one thing to that? I think it's, there's also a really interesting solution through the introduction of more real-time markets and, and more of that um, creating up that, that financial market. Because I think that would actually solve a lot of the financial pressures on discoms where they're signing up to long-term PPAs, which are no longer in the money, or there's decreased demand from customers that doesn't support the cost of paying against those PPAs. And what we're seeing, of course, is this unfortunate mismatch where you've got oversupply under some long-term PPAs, and that's not be really being able to be dispatched and used because of that. And I think, you know, in many ways I see... Um, that opening up that market as a way to actually relieve that financial pressure on discoms by participating in those markets. Now, as as you said, that that can't happen overnight. Um, and I just was going to make the point. You said, how do we? What must corporates be doing to get above the fifty percent ceiling? I think one of the key things is to be really lobbying the regulators to help open up that opportunity because it, the, the the solutions are there and the willingness from corporates and developers and everyone to do it is there. And I think part of it is having that sort of unified voice from corporates and lobbying to the government say, look, let's just open this up because there's a real possibility here. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I'm going to also kind of uh, invite Mike for a quick reflection on that. But Mike, uh, with that question, I'm also going to add one more. Uh, you know, for you, uh, and this is really a quick reflection on uh, the RTC procurement framework that the Indian government is championing. And this is uh, this is this is a recent development, and of course, a welcome one. We've clearly seen a shift in the way in which the government is thinking, which is also a great message for the renewable energy space in general. Because we've almost a decade back, wherein we were looking for a preferential treatment for renewable energy, now we are you know at a stage wherein we are looking at uh, thermal assets actually complementing renewable energy, you know, and you know that that's a drastic shift in the way in the message, as well as you know the way the renewable energy market is shaped and evolved in the country. Uh, but specifically on the RTC procurement framework, do you see that there are any 
impacts of it on the corporate RE market and the way in which the companies make some of the choices. So uh, take your time, have uh, reflections on the first question as well as the one on RTC mine. Mine to you. Uh, thanks, Abdul. Uh, so that's that's uh, you know two different uh, parts, but let me cover the first part uh, which you which you raised. Uh, so corporates getting to hundred percent, I, I I sort of completely agree with Paul and Andrew in terms of you know you re you really have to think whether hundred percent is really uh, an artificial target in some ways and saying that you know I, what if you are ninety percent is it the, the in, intent is really that you know you have to be a lot greener company and so on. So I think the objective needs to be understood behind uh, behind that uh, commitment. Uh, but I think you know the the first thing I'll start with is to actually say that you know uh, there needs to be commitment to it as as an objective and as a as a belief. Right. So it's like saying that you know there were a lot of industries and a lot of corporates that were committed to safety, for example, right? And I actually relate. Uh, a lot of RE procurement to that, saying that you know this is also something that you're doing for the general good of, uh, you know, from from in terms of being a good corporate citizen and you know you're doing the right thing, whether it is for your employees, whether it is for the society, whether it is for uh, you know gen the general environment, right? So, so sorry, so so that that is an important. Uh, sorry, this seems to be an echo. Uh, so that that is an important uh, sort of start for me. That you know you have to you have to uh, you have to sort of marry yourself to that objective, and uh, you know get to the point where you say that this is what I this is what we want to do as a corporate. Now whether we get you know just like in the safety journey, I would say you know whether we get to a stage five or whether we get to a stage four. Doesn't matter. You to you know you're at right now at stage zero, and I can tell you a lot of corporates today are at stage zero, right? Uh, and for in terms of uh, the second aspect, I would say is you know when when you think about the barrier, I I think the barrier has already shifted from 50 percent to around 70 to 80 percent. I think now it's very easy to get to a 70 to 80 percent uh, CUF. Uh, on on uh, RTC kind of uh, products, we looked at the RTC, uh, the pure RE RTC product, uh, which was, which was, uh, you know, uh, which was uh, tendered by Seki, and it had a requirement of around 80% CUF. Again, you know, that's something that uh, Renew Power won the entire allocation on, but that was 80% CUF for the year, and you know, out of uh, almost out of the year, of almost 65 time blocks, we were actually we are actually going to deliver 100% of power under that. Uh, tender, right? So, so I think there are clearly, high, uh, you know, uh, renewables has graduated from from the point where you say that even from a physical PPA constructs, we can actually get to 70 to 80 percent uh, reasonably easily, uh, or, and reasonably in a cost comparative manner, right? So that's number one. I think for the rest, it is definitely, you know, it will have to come through the markets, and uh, you know, but but I think you know, trying to Trying to think of uh, India to get to that level uh, where the markets are deep enough to for, for us to square off positions and that to be assured of green attributes for that squared off position uh, is 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 a is a while to go in my mind. I think the the thing that might happen earlier is actually uh, maybe storage costs coming down and then maybe just making uh, that that leap from 70 to 80 to maybe 100 percent much more uh, much more feasible. Right, but uh, you know, again, sticking to that theme, I, I doubt if you know any any corporate in the past has asked what my what my returns are for my safety investments, or you know, why should I aim for another uh, you know to save another life in my on my shop floor, right? So it's, it's it is it is with that objective that frankly, you know, you have to while it is cost comparative, and I agree to you know what has been said and. Ari has shown shown that it is cost comparative vis-a-vis -vis all the other options. But I've always questioned that, you know, why was there no push even when there was cost, you know, even when Ari was not cost comparative? Where are the, where is the, you know, the corporate uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, push towards greening solutions, even if it comes at a premium? I mean, you know, we have, we have uh, corporate citizens uh, in, in India and abroad that can actually champion and they, they have to be always early adopters in any, any technology and any, you know, area. So I would say, you know, that's, 
that's the push for corporate uh, customers you know say you know please take the lead don't uh, you know I, while now today re is in fact cheaper i would say you know set aside some investment be 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 ready to pay a premium if needed uh, to a certain extent right that's on the first part i think on the on the second part uh, yes you know uh, the the rtc the re thermal combination of rtc is very welcome move obviously uh, it it you know even in the future obviously we in the near future at least we clearly see re and uh, thermal coexisting uh, it it can happen at a grid level but now you know i think it's being pushed at a generator level as well and they do combine really well to uh, to provide firm solutions for uh, for uh, you know this comes right now obviously the framework is largely for uh, utility procurement but i think uh, corporates can think of it in the same manner right as i said you know you don't need to necessarily think about uh, 100% re that you know unless a product is you know unless i'm getting 100% re i'm not going to sign up for it if it if it broadly moves your position and if it says you know it's 70 80% re even if the remaining 20 30% is thermal or gas or i mean you know coal or gas or you know even if it's exchange as i think you know people have pointed out so you know be a so be it you know you by the way on the exchange also right now at least we don't have green dam or green rtm markets to really force or push that you know there is only green power available on those exchanges but there are there are exchange products available and uh, you know you could you could as a as a uh, you know corporate or a customer you could very well square off the remaining 20 30% against you know either rex or uh, you know and just buy it from the exchange so there are multiple options i feel you know i feel really that even from a regulatory standpoint today there are a lot of options available for a corporate that is really in, you know has the intent to move its position and you know has the commitment to move from point a to point b i think that commitment and that urgency is what is missing right now and you know i think as long as corporate champions come with that commitment and that urgency you have the enabling framework to be able to move maybe not to 100% maybe to as i said 80% okay great thanks man uh but that i know we are running short of time as well so i'm just going to place in two more questions and i'm going to welcome in shelesh here shelesh uh, why is cdp asking for more transparency from companies and how does that lead into you know opening up the market for corporate re in india and i'm also going to plug this with another question that i've seen uh from the audience which is about um, you know the rex and if indian rex can be uh you know traded on international markets i think that question is already responded but i think it's a good question for the the larger audience to know as well so if you could quickly uh you know respond to the two questions that would be great thanks shalvesh yeah thanks atul uh, is my voice audible we can hear you well go ahead great yeah so uh, at uh, both at cdp and re100 uh, transparency is uh, is the key actually which we basically promote uh, among um, our campaigns uh, as well as uh, larger cdp's uh, reporting platform where we ask companies uh, to report on transparent manner uh, especially on the energy sector basically what we ask is uh, what kind of issues they are facing uh, uh, about uh, sourcing various renewable energy uh, using various renewable energy sourcing options uh, type of geography and uh, what kind of technologies they have used so once they become more transparent then we basically use this information in our uh, various reporting platforms like like an re100 annual report and various other disclosure report where we highlight uh, these issues which corporates are facing in different markets and uh, that is a key way actually that is a, that becomes a key platform uh, a, a stakeholder communication platform where we communicate this information these issues to larger audience including uh, the policy makers uh, this is also evident from a uh, lot of discussions we are uh, we had and we are having with uh, policy makers including ministry of new and renewable energy which uh, where we actually communicated about these issues in the past and they are aware of uh, uh the overall corporate energy demand through these uh, disclosures companies are making uh, to re100 for 
or even hundred uh, targets, and for to CDP for our, our larger climate change disclosure platform. And then we uh, and and Aminari uh, especially uh, because this is a live example from Indian uh, market is they have uh, identified the overall demand of uh, great renewable energy uh, just to uh, get the picture of what uh, like what kind of demand we are trying to shift to renewable energy sources and uh, what are the barriers they faced in the uh, over the period of time in the market so that they can take some concrete actions and communicate about these issues to the relevant policy makers in different uh, uh, ministries and departments. Uh, um, so that's, that's what uh, we already did. And uh, that is actually a key requirement uh, to, uh, from our side to become more transparent, uh, communicate about these issues, and also, uh, also get uh, an opportunity to communicate this issue to the right audience. This is very important. Uh, uh, aspect uh, of RE100 initiative, uh, for example. So, uh, for making this uh, transparent uh, transparency and uh, reporting the renewable energy consumption in credible manner, uh, there are a variety of standards available in the market which companies use. But you know, for uh, renewable energy reporting exclusively, there are these standards are not available in abundance. Uh, like uh, greenhouse gas reporting have, have become a um, a gold standard, especially for GHG protocol, ISO 14064 kind of uh, standards are available for corporates to report it. But uh, when we talk about renewable energy reporting, so how should they do it? What kind of renewable energy sourcing options they should consider, which is credible, and how they can secure these consumer claims uh, using these options? Like uh, there is always a risk in all of this renewable energy procurement that someone else is also claiming the same renewable energy attribute. Which is known as double counting, and that is should that should not happen when companies uh, are paying for that renewable energy attributes. So, how to secure that? How to secure consumer claims, etc. So, the answer is we have uh, RE100 technical criteria, which has become a gold standard in renewable energy reporting over the period of time, which companies use and uh, report their renewable energy consumption in a credible manner. So, now the question is how this is relevant. Uh, in uh, corporate's uh, journey to renewable ener energy sourcing is basically when companies report a certain portion of renewable energy uh, up to uh, less than 100% or up to 100%, they want to be sure that all of the uh, energy, renewable energy they have consumed, they have exclusive ownership rights on those renewable energy consumption, okay, so that they can communicate about it to, the, uh, to our different stakeholders. And that's how we help them uh, via our reporting process. And uh, that's why the transparency is actually a key and that's how we help companies to become transparent in more structured uh, way. Like, uh, for example, companies have a variety of uh, communication medium, right? Their annual report or the sustainability report, etc. But uh, the uh, st the standardization can become an issue. So that is something uh, uh, we are start starting out, uh, and we, uh, we are uh, improving these reporting standards uh, uh, in near future as well. In terms of answering the question on Indian RECs uh, and uh, voluntary RECs, uh, so this is Indian uh, Renewable Energy Certificate is a compliance instrument which has been uh, developed to meet uh, targets under renewable, uh, uh, basically RP or renewable purchase obligations by government of India. So, uh, however, the same instrument can also be used to meet uh, voluntary targets uh, like RE100 targets, and uh, whereas. Uh, IREX and TIGR, these are the voluntary renewable energy tracking system and certification system, which anybody can use and uh, register its renewable energy project, issue renewable energy attributes, and corporates can use these attributes to claim exclusive ownership on this renewable energy um, uh, consumption. So these two systems are goes uh, parallel. Uh, there is no connection between two sy this is systems in India right now. Uh, but however, companies can use both options, both Indian RECs as well as uh, voluntary uh, energy attribute certificates. I think the decisive factor here from corporate side is uh, the price of the certificates because uh, most of the companies procure renewable energy to uh, basically for the price competitiveness uh, as compared with the um, electricity which they can get from the utility. So they, are, uh, they always prefer to have uh, renewable energy as uh, the same price or, uh, or lower price. Whereas uh, buying uh, like unbundled energy attribute certificates uh, always comes with a cost. So that's a decision factor for corporates to select uh, which certificate they should opt for, uh, depending on the pricing range. So I hope that answers uh, the question. So, Thank you. Thanks, Shalish. I'm going to take a last question, and you spoke about Rex. Um, and this is maybe a quick reflection from all the panelists about Rex. Uh, and I could start with Paul. Uh, there is generally this myth about RECs, and most of the companies that we have interacted with 
shy away from actually using this instrument. It's of course a market mechanism. Um, it's uh, it's a it's got some, it's got a great potential. The government has backing from it. Recently, the Central Regulatory Commission of India has actually uh, removed the flow price for the Rex in India, which means that it's it's signaling a few things, right? And, and the market needs to kind of understand some of the signals as well. Uh, it's it's kind of lowered the forbearance price to thousand rupees per rec. Uh, so with that, um, just wanted to get a sense of a quick sense from the panel. How should companies start treating recs? He can you know because and and what can be done in terms of working with corporations to dispel this notion that recs are not a credible and a real way of achieving some of their targets. So maybe a quick thirty seconds reflection from everyone on the panel. Paul, Bhavna, Mayank, and Andrew, and we could then close the conversation. Paul, do you? Yeah, so thanks. Just a couple of quick thoughts. I think the first thing to clarify is that if, if a REC scheme is properly designed, you, you know that you're not giving RECs that, that uh, for generation hasn't occurred, it's for the eligible sources, and you don't have double counting, then a REC scheme is a great scheme. It, it has full environmental integrity if it's run. So I don't think it should be any concerns about the environmental integrity of a REC scheme. And I think certainly within the context of IA100 and other schemes, it definitely has a place, a role to play. I think, and that's, so that's going to that point. I think the, the point about RECs, and I think what I see from my observation in the Indian market is that, is that the REC schemes is sort of sitting somewhat outside of everything else and sort of on the side. Um, if you look at REC successful REC schemes and how they've been renewables in markets, they've very much been um, a strong, high RPO percentage. That obligation is typically placed on the utility disk um, so that you have a mandated demand for those to go into the market and procure more renewables. Now, that doesn't necessarily make that um, as attractive to corporate because they may not have that legal liability to procure the power. So it does depend on how the REC scheme is set up. But I would say environmental integrity is not an issue. It's more a question of does it make economic sense in the context of how that scheme fits with um, you know, the, all the other options in the Indian market. Any more reflections on that? Um, just a quick point uh, regarding uh, the Indian market, and I, uh, this is not just regarding the uh, EREC, uh, I mean regarding uh, RECs, or it, it's uh, primarily about most such um, certificates primarily that are available, even for palm oil certificates, for example. Most companies in India to pay a certain premium to buy something which um, they inherently see as something which is uh, are cost effective by uh, setting up their own plant and it's tangible versus intangible which also becomes a, a challenge but from my pr perspective beyond a certain point when you hit that ceiling uh, rex can be an option um, but of course, the, the traceability and uh, tracking is extremely important and building a certain system, especially around voluntary. I mean, with, this, uh, with the compliance, uh, it's much clearer, but when it comes, it comes into the voluntary space, it becomes more complex at some level. And the third point I wanted to make is that, especially when it comes to green certificates, sorry, so green tariffs, I mean, that would be another really excellent way as an alternative, I would see, because if, if companies are not ready to pay even an extra uh, 10, uh, uh, 10 pesa on, on over and above current uh, tariffs, um, then instead of buying a REC, you could consider green tariffs, uh, essentially, to buying directly from the discom. It makes it a lot more simpler, less com complicated. And that obviously depends on the discom being interested in, in selling that. So I would consider that as a good alternative. And then plus, I mean, I think one of the challenge that I probably didn't mention as to why um, renewables are not really picking up in India is primarily because the discounts are in a financial distress situation. And so a lot of the open access transactions are taking away um, their high paying customers. And that's one of the biggest reasons why they're pushing back on any kind of open access transactions. And if you're addressing that from a financial perspective and, and ensuring that they have the viability to sustain themselves, then obviously it becomes clear. Sorry, a long answer to a 30 second question. No, thank you, Bhavla. And my apologies, guys. I'll have to close this conversation now. I, I think uh, just uh, in the interest of time, I've been giving reminders about that. So uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, you know uh, your inputs today, your contributions on all the conversations. It was great to have 
your perspective. I, I know we haven't kind of touched the elephant in the room, which is the distribution company. Uh, it's it, it's a different ball game altogether and needs a different strategy and a conversation. So with that, I'll end and I'll hand it over to Joyce. Uh, and once again, thanks everyone uh, for your con uh, your participation. Joyce, to you. Thank you. Thanks thank you me. very much, Atul, and a very warm thank you to all of our presenters and speakers for, for joining us today and, and for an insightful discussion. Um, so at this point, we've, we've run fairly over time. Um, so what we're going to do now is to close the webcast and uh, we'll take a five minute break. But um, after that five minutes, we'll actually reopen a few rooms right here in sessions for some small group networking. So we do encourage you um, to come back and uh, have continued the discussion in, in groups of three or four. Um, we'll have a few different rooms open, some divided by sector. Baker McKenzie experts are also kindly going to stay uh, on hand for questions or discussions on market readiness, while CDP will be on hand for any issues related to technical verification um, and RECs. So uh, again, a five minute break, but then we'll see you back here um, in networking sessions. Um, as well, the networking function on the left hand side is available to anyone at any time to uh, enjoy one on one randomized matching with another attendee. So with that, we'll close the webcast here. On behalf of the organizers and partners, I warmly thank our audience today for their attention and uh, we'll see you back in five minutes. Thank you. <laughs>